starting, giving the floor to Alana. I want to say for the people who participate here that we actually put a huge effort to make it affordable and accessible for participants. And that actually implied that lots of speakers not only didn't get paid for the work they did or coming, you know, of, in terms of lecturing, but they also paid their own expenses to come. This is the case of Alana, who actually made their own way here to what present their work. So, <laughs> yeah, so everybody who want to pay things to her later, you're welcome to her and to Mira, but also to all the lecturers who literally came here on their own, like Will, and they all agreed on the fact that it was necessary to make the summer school truly accessible to those who need it. This is not something that happens all the time. So I want to thank her for this effort and I'll let her introduce herself. Because if I do, I'm very lucky that I cry and I don't want to show how emotional I am. <laughs> so I give the floor to her. Firstly, let me start by thanking Marilena. So we've known each other since 2012. We met in um, so-called Sydney, Australia, actually on Gadigal land, uh, where I still live. Um, and, and it's been a very beautiful and positive relationship since then. We've done a lot of things together that we can maybe talk to you about over some drinks. Um, and I'd also like to thank, of course, Gaia, um, Pagla, um, Inej, and Wow, and have I forgotten anybody? Everybody who's made the event so far so, so great. So, look, I gave a title for this talk, but I'm not sure that's what I'm actually going to be talking about because it's part of a work in progress, so please bear with me. I also feel a little bit sorry that you all have to sit here having already, you know, spent a whole afternoon, well, a whole day, so yeah, bear with me if you can. I'll try to make it interesting. Um, and I just also want to say uh, just two or three words about myself. So I am a Jewish European woman from um, Romanian uh, Holocaust uh, escapees uh, background on one side of my family and Lithuanian Jews who migrated to Ireland at the turn of the 20th century on the other side of my family. Um, I was born on occupied Palestinian land, I grew up in Ireland, and I now live on occupied Gadigal land. So you can see that race has always been very much to do with my own trajectory. Um, all right, so let me, let me get into my talk. Um, and hopefully, I'm more than happy for people to stop me if there's anything that you want to add or a question that you might have, um, or we can do that at the end, and I'll, I'll hopefully not take too long. All right, so as you're probably aware, on July the 1st, 2022, the so-called Stop Woke Act came into effect in the state of Florida in uh, Turtle Island. Governor Ron DeSantis signed the House Bill 7 uh, in April, um, which is legislation supposed to, and I quote, give businesses, employees, children, and families tools to stand up against discrimination and woke indoctrination. The Florida government press release states that this legislation is the first of its kind in the nation to take on both corporate wokeness and critical race theory in schools in one act. The law bans lessons and training on race and diversity in schools, extending the Trump presidency's executive order banning anti-racism and diversity training inspired by critical race theory. That's the way they put it. Now, as you'll all be aware, versions of what we can call the war on critical race theory proliferate across many sites, and at least today I'm not going to be going into specifics. I don't think it's particularly interesting to give you a litany of examples of how this is happening in various places, but suffice it to say that each um, case is different, and it's not a case of the specific folk devil of CRT being picked up and run with in other places with a very different makeup uh, to the US. I don't think it's as simple as saying that, because indeed Americanization has long been wielded as a slur against anti-racist or decolonial or indigenous, as it's called, as a slur in the French context, um, most notably in France. And I'm thinking way back to the 90s with the paper by Bourdieu and Bacon, the coming of imperialist reasons. So this has always been, and it's also come from the left, 
as well as from the right. So I think we need to extend back and think, I mean, stand back and think about this in a much more um, complex way. So while many have become exercised by demonstrating that people who oppose CRT don't really understand it, or they try to say, you know, don't worry, it's not really taught in schools, and this kind of thing. I'm thinking of the, you know, quite a few videos that Mark Lamont Hill has done, where he kind of interviews these opponents of CRT and tries to get them to see the other side of things. Um, I don't think that this is about misunderstanding what CRT is, and I don't think that we should be defending ourselves on this basis, yeah? So, for example, I mean, I guess one thing that we need to say is that one of the principal actors here in the U.S. context is a guy called Christopher Rufo, and he's a conservative former documentary filmmaker, um, and he's a senior fellow at the center-right Manhattan Institute, um, and he, um, he basically was the trigger for Trump's executive order when he gave sort of an anti-CRT monologue on Tucker Carlson, which is the Fox News guy who's very, very fascist. So I just read the tweets from Christopher Rufo that have now kind of gone down in history as like, you know, the important thing. So he said, uh, this is from uh, 15th of March, 2021, he tweeted, we have successfully frozen their brand, critical race theory, into the public conversation and are steadily driving up negative perceptions. We will eventually turn it toxic as we put all of the various cultural insanities under that brand category. And then on the same day, he says, the goal is to have the public read something crazy in the newspaper and immediately think critical race theory. We have decodified the term and will recodify it to annex the entire range of cultural constructions that are unpopular with Americans. Now, who the Americans are, you know, you lead to your imagination. So, it has been a successful strategy, as can be seen in scenes across the US with parents protesting against their children's exposure to the correct uh, history on race and slavery, and interestingly, rather less on settler colonialism, but possibly we could discuss that um, later on. So Rufo has been credited with a fixation on CRT, which he reached by reading the footnotes of books by Robin DiAngelo uh, and Ibram X. Kendi, who referred to people like Kimberly Crenshaw and Derek Bell, of course the founders of CRT, um, and he says that it was rewritten in his narrative as an ideology CRT now, upon which anti-racism training principles were founded. And in his first article on the topic for City Journal, which is the magazine of the Manhattan Institute, he wrote, and I quote, under the banner of anti-racism, Seattle's Office of Civil Rights is now explicitly endorsing principles of, now wait for it, segregationism, group-based guilt, and race essentialism, ugly concepts that should have been left behind a century ago. So already you're noting how a sort of a pseudo-anti-racist language, or at least a post-racial or a race-neutral or a non-racist language is being incorporated by the right. Yeah? So the real racists now, of course, are the anti-racists. But okay, to associate this war on CRT with one, uh, Rufo, or any of these other Machiavellian operators, I think, is to misunderstand the availability of these floating signifiers for use as tools in the attempt to dismantle anti-racist resistance. And my point here is that this is what this is really about, particularly after the global uprisings, the Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter uprisings. Now, of course, it's true that Rufo explicitly told the New Yorker that critical race theory is the perfect villain, but in terms of, of you know, advancing our understanding, of what race does, or the function of race, which I think this is what we're all interested in, I don't think it makes very much sense to pin this on one operator or any of these other operators, and there's many of them, yeah, in different places. What we need to do is to, is to be able to make sense of the political purpose of the war on CRT, and that purpose really is not very different from the continuous cycle of hegemonic opposition to any attempt to analyze and redress racism over whatever number of years. But the form it takes, I think, is different today, and the context in which it takes, in which it takes place is also particular, we might want to call it late racial capitalism, just an idea, and it's that that we need to get to grips with, um, not to be able to address the criticisms of CRT more effectively, um, because I think that we should refuse the terms set by our opponents because it's always a trap, right, to try to debate them on their own terms, 
But from our perspective as race scholars and activists, to enhance our own racial literacy and to deepen and widen radicalism and criticality. So that's where I'm coming to it from. So in order to do this, I want to situate this, um, well, I want to do three things, right? And the first thing is to situate this counter, sorry, this current wave of counter-revolutionary action, which focuses on CRT and other ciphers like the war on woke, for example, or stop woke, in the mainstream conceptualization of racism that is dominant in the public sphere. And I'm going to do this by recalling my arguments in my recent book, Why Race Still Matters, on this idea of not racism, which is the comic that I circulated to before, in case you haven't read it. I'm interested in how it became dominant, and also the role of specific academics within that, some of whom um, now play a major role in this war on CRT. So how this idea of not racism paradoxically coexists with the mounting acceptance of race realism, as it's called, which is basically eugenics, right? Um, which has grown with the pandemic in really, really worrying ways, and dovetailing with the clampdown on reproductive rights and the bodily autonomy of transgender and gender diverse peoples. All of this needs to be looked at in a nexus, right? So that's the first part of the paper. The second part of the paper, I'm asking for patience, because I want to move from this, for this, I'm basically writing a new book on this topic, and this is the first time I've had the opportunity to work these ideas out in public, so I do ask you to keep it to yourself. I'm not sure yet. I'm just throwing out some ideas on how we can use racial capitalism um, as a methodology and framework, and I've been inspired by my comrades, um, Kieran Turner, and, but also by the work of Josh Myers, for example. And also, another aspect is um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's notion of the anti-state state. And here I'm indebted to other people. who's written about this. Right, so that's the second part. The last, I'm so hot. The last part here is um, I want to address a practical question. So I'm not going to be really speaking about anti-racism so much, although that's always a subtext to all of my work. I started out as an anti-racist activist. My master's and my PhD were on anti-racism in Europe, so that's my, where my thing is, yeah? But I haven't really been able to develop that, so I need to do the research and I need to speak to people and so on. So what I do want to do is offer some questions or put some ideas out there about how those of us who are involved in teaching or political education and organizing, how can we teach through this thing? Or how can we have useful conversations? And I'm going to do this by um, returning to a paper by Stuart Hall. It's actually a talk that he gave to secondary school students in 1980 called Teaching Race, which some of you might be familiar with, but which is a very inspiring talk. Okay, so I don't want to go over stuff that Ruba already spoke about um, the other day, which is to do with the UK boring politics of Kemi Badenoch and Pretty Patel and all these kinds of stuff that you already, at least those of you who are at the summer school, will have heard, right? Basically, the point is that, you know, these women of color and other people of color who are in the leadership of this very racist, far-right-wing, conservative party, which has been in government in the UK for many, many years, um, they are now the sort of, they're bringing forth this anti-woke agenda, but also, particularly in Priti Patel's case, instituting some of the most draconian, racist policies against migrants and asylum seekers that possibly have ever been seen, even in this very racist colonial country, right? So, I think that the, the figures of these people, these, these figures, and of course of other black and brown people who have been advancing the stop woke or the anti-CRT agenda, and there's several of them in the US and in other places, it's kind of the apotheosis of what I call not racism in my book. And I, I define not racism as a quest to control the definition of racism that enacts a discursive racist violence. So basically beyond the denial of racism, so things like, you know, you would have heard people say, I'm not racist but, or I don't have a racist bone in my body. And if you look at the comic, I've got a bit about the racist bone, which I find like hilarious, right? What is particular to what I'm calling not racism is that it contains within it a definition of racism which is constructed negatively through opposition. So this definition is characterized by the fact that it denies negatively racialized people's experience um, of racism and their subjective understanding of what that looks like. Yeah? But beyond this, it also gives this definition of racism which is said to be more true, more real, and above all, more objective 
than that given by those who face racism themselves. And in my book, I wrote that central to not racism is the idea that those who experience racism can never be the true knowers of racism because they are too manipulated by their emotions, yeah? Now, paradox paradoxically on its face, then, I think the emergence of these native informants such as Badenoch and Patel, as well as these other, you know, these other actors, um, it kind of perfects this notion of not racism. What you have is a white conception of racism being advanced by black and people of color whose embodiment of a modern universalist epistemology permits their lived experience, but only their lived experience, to endorse a narrow, Eurocentric conception of racism that lives only in the domain of individual attitudes and extremist intentions. So, thus detaching from what Miri Song has called the um, history, severity, and power of racism, a, a historical account of what racism is. But again, too much can be made of these figures, and we've had them before, right? These people are not new. Think about people like Ayan, Hirsi Ali, right? Uh, or even Adolf Reed on the left, right? We have these people. But I'm rather interested in the racializing processes of the attachments of the attacks on CRT on black people and people of color in a way that actually turns the spotlight off the constant reinscription of white supremacy that the hyper focus on these individuals, the Badenochs and the Patels, who often actually just appear as ciphers or tropes, what this entails, what does this mean? I think it's much more interesting to look at how the hegemonic understandings of racism available to us participate in creating the moral panics that race constantly is involved in reinscribing. And as Ruth Wilson Gilmore following Stuart Hall has noted, racism actually is always inscribed in this mode of crisis. So I think it's really important that we don't respond on those terms, right? Because they pose it as a crisis, we don't take it on as a crisis, yeah? So in my book, I try to trace the development of this dominant interpretation of racism and how baked into it is the separation of, from an understanding of race as colonially constituted, which I propose, and this is my definition, uh, is a technology of power, mentioned the other day, for the management of human difference with the purpose of producing, reproducing, and maintaining white supremacy on a local and a planetary scale. And for those of you, you know, you'll be aware that there's a lot of parallels between my definition um, and somebody like Falvin Shade, who's written about racism. Technology, Geraldine Hang, and of course Cedric Robinson. So, theorizing race in this way allows us to be quite less surprised, I think, that the racial state can come in the package of a Kemi Badenoch or a Priti Patel, while at the same time keeping in play the centrality of anti blackness to the production and reproduction of race. If we know one thing about race, it is its ability to be attached to a range of seemingly incommensurable practices and processes. This is its strength, and it is for this reason that we need to talk about why race still matters, as I said in the title of my book, rather than trying to bypass it analytically. Um, basically, I'm arguing that we should all be working with and against race, yeah, in this kind of dialect. So in contrast to a view of race as a set of practices and processes that constantly divide and redivide groups within the population, prefigured as immutable, in other words, as fixed, with the purpose of variously exploiting, dominating, or co-opting them within the white supremacist racial colonial order, the dominant explanation of racism is a completely different thing, right? So basically, most people think, well, what is racism? They say, well, it's basically a moral wrong based on bad science, okay? So colonialism out of the picture, culturality out of the picture, it's all about attitudes and ideas, yeah, or beliefs. And let me say that I think this is reproduced within a lot of academic work to really detrimental effect. Yes? And has a long history, as Mary Lena knows about and will tell us. Yeah. So this perspective, I think, yields a very thin understanding of racism. And that understanding is basically an aberrant behavior, so it's something not normal. And that we can measure it and then punish it, or perhaps educate it out of individuals. So this is the bad apple, right, that we're all familiar with. And this view, turn, in turn, lends itself to becoming something that can be expressed by anyone, regardless of how they are racialized. So this is how we get anti-white racism, yeah? 
So as an idea or a term, racism, according to Barnum Hesse, is a Eurocentric formulation that focuses on the rising ideology of European fascism and the application of racial sciences to European populations at a particular time. So given this, the concept of racism, as we have been handed it down, right, has actually been really bad at, you know, being able to encapsulate the racial colonial order as it is actually practiced, you know, um, yeah, as it's actually practiced. So the original formulation of racism itself puts a racialized hierarchy in place by prioritizing certain forms of injustice carried out in the name of race over others. And in my book, I, I talk a lot about how anti-Semitism is presented as the prototype of all kinds of racism, and if it doesn't match to the Holocaust, then it's not really racism. I mean, you know, I'm being schematic, but it's a longer argument that I don't have time for now. So this narrow conceptualization of racism, which detach it from the longer history of race, deny how discursively race developed through various formations um, and Stuart Hall talks about this, he talks about the religious, the geographical, the cultural, and lastly only the biological and the genetic. And of course, you know, somebody like Alexander Wehelia will talk about racializing assemblages as a much more useful way of thinking about, and you also spoke about that guy in your talk. So, the attachment of race to a singular meaning, which is the dominant thing, right? So this idea of a biological genetic hierarchy, which is what we're told race is about, is actually really problematic for understanding race as a key technology of power in modernity. In fact, race is a really messy and unstable concept that develops in situ within regimes of racial rule. So obviously colonialism, slavery, migration and borders, and it constantly adapts and readapts to circumstance. So to function as a shorthand for human diversity, race necessarily must rely on a range of legitimizing ideas that are then attached to bodies, yeah? The continuing blurriness about how race coheres with certain bodies and how that shifts and slides constantly is evidence of how tenuous that attachment is and actually how much work, you know, constantly has to be done to build and maintain these bodily racial boundaries. Yeah, it's not a given. If we accept it as a given, we buy into the logic of race, yeah? So in my book, I argue that we need to go beyond repeating this idea that race is a social construct, because what we really need to do is to show how, why, and in which circumstances race is made and remade, socially, politically, and culturally. Now, to delve a little bit deeper into this, um, in the book, and again, it's in the comic, I look at the role of uh, French anthropologists in the 1920s and 30s in developing this original formulation of racism. Yeah? So the word racism isn't used until the end of the 19th century, and it's only used with force during this particular time. And I'm relying here on the work of the French historian, Carole Bruno Paligot, who did this research. Um, and she shows how this anti-racist activism of these anthropologists who coined the term racism was consistent with their own engagement in pure racial science in colonized locations. They literally went to the colonies and did cranial measurements on colonized subjects, and at the same time they had a journal in France which was called Race and Racism and was an anti-racist journal, right? So, and yeah, so this is massively problematic. And I think we need to understand that to understand why we have the dominant conceptualization of racism that we that we are forced to work with, right? Now, of course, other people have defined it in different ways. I'm not trying to say we're stuck there, but I'm talking about hegemonic interpretations, not activist or, you know, uh, race-critical interpretations. So this Eurocentric severing of ideological racism, this moral idea of racism, from actual racial rule, paved the way for the liberal understanding of racism that still dominates today. So basically, we think, as I said, Racism is a moral wrong, that it's about having bad attitudes and beliefs about other people who are racially distinct, who are, as you would say, of a different race, right, to use the colloquial way of talking, yeah? Now, obviously, the problem with this definition is that not only does it lend itself to being universalized, as I said earlier, you know, everybody then can have a racist attitude, but it also separates the realm of beliefs and values from the realm of practices, policies, laws, technologies, which is the area in which the areas in which race as a form of governance actually operates. So the fact that racism is seen in this way, I think, gives us a clue as to why there is so much outrage 
when people are called a racist, right? Because obviously what you're doing when you say you're racist, the other person hears that as I am immoral, right? They're not seeing it as descriptive of a situation. They're feeling it as like, you know, casting aspersions on their character. So, you know, I can give lots of examples, but I think that, you know, you get how this works in order to save on time. So, my argument basically is that the dominant Eurocentric understanding of racism that originated in early 20th century anti-racist thought is at the origins of this interpretation. And in, in recent years, um, again in the book, I looked at the role of particular academics and pundits in advancing not racism. So how do we get from the early 20th century to the early 21st century? And you know, there are a whole range of examples, but the one I want to focus on, um, somebody such as the political sci scientist Eric Kaufman, who works in London, and somebody with whom he works with very closely, who's, uh, I guess, a journalist, and then he has a think tank, who's a guy called David Goodhart. And both of them have been involved, they're not the only ones, but they've been providing the intellectual basis, so-called, for what has now morphed into the war on critical race in the UK context. But of course, you know, as I said before, there are similar people in other contexts. And France, I think, is particularly interesting, because whereas Kaufman and Goodhart would probably position themselves on the centre-right, although we would probably position them much further up, not the left, on the right. Um, in France, you'll have people who think of themselves as left as being very opposed to, 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 to race, right? So, and I think, you know, this is very problematic for us, I guess, because we think of ourselves as belonging up to the left, right? But in the context in which race scholars and activists and decolonial scholars and so on are being attacked, we actually cannot rely on the traditional left to have a politics of care uh, towards us, right? Because obviously we often fall, you know, we're often accused by the left of reducing everything to race and not getting on board with a project to, universalist project of the, you know, the, the working class and so on. And so in the third chapter of my book, I talk about this, the, the kind of the left approach, which I think we often leave out of the picture and I think it's really important to do that. Anyway, without repeating the argument of the book too much, and now just looking briefly at Goodhart and Kaufman, they advance this idea of the so-called normal definition of racism, which they define as, or this is Goodhart actually defines as, quote, an irrational fear or hatred or contempt of another group. And this definition of racism, according to Goodhart, has been subjected to what he calls mission creep. In other words, edging away from the quote-unquote normal definition. So obviously Goodhart's idea is really inscribed in a, in a very Eurocentric episteme, wherein the divide between rational and irrational thinking is wielded against black and indigenous peoples who remain, according to him, in the domain of the prehistorical. And so it's very obvious to me how the idea of a so-called normal definition of racism, which is always irrational in their view, plays into the attack on decolonial thought and activism, which obviously wants to call into question the racializing nature of this rational, irrational splitting, yeah? So in fact, of course, it's untrue, you know, to say that racism is always irrational on either logical or moral ground. And, you know, let's just look at slavery as the prime example of people enacting racism in a rational, profit-seeking manner. To not say, of course, emotions were involved and hate is involved, but what is the core of slavery about, yeah? So by proposing a separation between racism and what Eric Kaufman calls racial self-interest, which is, he says, a form of white identity politics, which is as legitimate as any other form of identity politics, the so-called normal definition of racism, or what I would call not racism, is wielded to delegitimate anti-racist struggles and to, importantly, place white nativism on an equal basis with black radicalism or anti-racist or anti-colonial struggle. So everything is identity politics and we're all the same. So if you have the right, I have the right, yeah? The appearance of black and people of color figures as major players in this war on woke or the war on CRT, and more, more worryingly, as I said earlier, as in actors of racial repression, policing, uh, let's look at New York, let's look at Chicago, <laughs> or let's look at Pretty Patel when it comes to borders, is evidence of the fact for people like Kaufman and Goodhart that the real racists are actually the anti-racists. Because if you're saying, I oppose Pretty Patel because her policies are racist, they'll reinterpret it as you're being racist against her because she's a brown woman, right? So this is problematic. And indeed, Kaufman's 2018 book, White Shift, lays the ground 
for much of the dominant writer's discourse that is prominent today by claiming that what he calls, and this is a quote from his lovely book, um, a hegemonic left moralist agenda denies anyone with a different view on race, including of course people of color, the right to speak on issues of race. Viewpoint diversity that I mentioned earlier, and what my friend and colleague Gavin Tickley calls debatability, which he says is the incessant recursive attention as to what counts as racism and who gets to define it, then puts us in a position as anti-racist of permanent defensiveness, wasting our time, as Toni Morrison would put it, and under this guise, committing this constant shaping and reshaping of the racial state, which is going on while we are all trying to, you know, defend ourselves against these attacks. So, let me see the time. I don't want to keep you for too long. Okay, I spoke for 27 minutes, not too bad. All right. Okay, so to make this concrete, racist debatability has given even what used to come under, and this is very interesting to me, so even what we used to accept would be the normal definition of racism, in other words, openly eugenicist views, are now, you know, up for an open airing. Why not? It's viewpoint diversity. So you'll have people like, you know, this guy Noah Carl, who was a postdoctoral researcher at Cambridge, who was basically advancing eugenics, and it was fired from Cambridge a few years ago. But Kaufman and Goodhart and all of these guys got together and raised 100,000 pounds for his defense plan, I mean, basically to keep him going so he could continue doing his important, you know, cranial measurement and whatever else he was doing, um, even though he was fired. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has been, you know, really created the perfect conditions for the rapid advancement of bogus ideas such as liberal eugenics, which apparently is better than, I don't know, normal eugenics, wherein this group of so-called contrarian academics, this is what they call themselves, um, so this is like journalists, academics, and pundits, use the pages of what they like to call the intellectual dark web, which makes it sound very sexy, uh, in online publications such as Collect, uh, Unheard, and Aereo, and you know, it's masses of them, um, to propose, contra all the evidence, that any explanation of, for example, the morbidity rates of black, indigenous, and Latino people during the pandemic, um, that this has got nothing to do with race, right? Now, the most radical move here is the complementarity of the apparently contradictory positions that race is the technology of power, according to them, explains nothing, while bio-race <coughs> explains everything. It's important to note how this group of far-right intellectual activists who present themselves as you know, merely asking questions or merely debating openly oppose the idea of race as a social construct because it denies the biological facticity of race as far as they would see it, but at the same time, anyone on the anti-racist left who opposes a uh, counter-revolutionary black person or a person of color, as I said before, so the bad ones and so on, is the real racist, so I kind of repeat that. So this logic not only explains how race is always central in the exercise of internal and external colonial power, but it also how its force is precisely in not having to be consistent, right? You don't have to be logical, right? This is why we now have a situation that I personally face, wherein anti-Zionist Jews, such as myself, are now accused of being anti-Semitic by non-Jewish philo semites and Zionists, right? And this is, this is a very serious, and people have lost their jobs, right? This is the situation we're in. So the expression of openly eugenicist under the guise of just asking questions and the growing acceptability of this under the terms of debatability and against what is presented as the shutting down of speech by anti-racists and teachers of critical race obviously lends itself to the current onslaught on the bodily autonomy of trans and gender diverse people as well as the incursion as we've seen in the US, Poland and other places uh, into the rights um, of you know, people to do what they want with their own body. And just, you know, I don't have the time to expand on this too much. It's a topic that I still need to research, but I think it's really important to know that the same actors, obviously, are at the front of both of these CRT and bodily autonomy attack. Just yesterday, our same friend, Christopher Rufo, tweeted another lovely tweet from him. He says, tomorrow, and that means today, I'll be publishing my first report in a new series on gender ideology in K-12 schools. My goal is to publish one story per week for six weeks, establishing the frame 
driving multiple news cycles and generating 500 million media impressions. Get ready to rumble. All right, that's today. It. It's scary, yeah. So second, there is no way of theorizing this separately. And this is something I think very important for us to note. And I think that anti-racists who try to mobilize an analytical separation between race and gender do so at their peril. And I want to say that, for me at least, this is not about intersectionality, because I think that's a concept that easily co-optable by liberalism. But it's really about the ways that, um, really about the always already racialized or colonial conceptions of gender and the boundary policing that is practiced. And I'm just putting it out there, but think, you know, I'm asking you to think here about, you know, degendered understanding of black and indigenous women under slavery and colonialism, thinking here about the work of Angela Davis, Maria Lugones, and others. Okay. So, all right, so having said all of this, this is the second part of the paper, and this is the part that I ask you for patience because it's the new, some new ideas, yeah? I'll just go up, up and down, just to be right.